guys stop right there first thing i need you guys to do is subscribe if you haven't yet smash that like button and please share uh we're giving a 40 dollars gift card of your choice as soon as we hit the 250 subscriber mark on today's show we have kevin the high he's a life coach and a motivational speaker he's uh battled with depression anxiety body dysmorphia and he's gonna tell you guys how he has overcome that his struggles and uh i think in today's episode is going to be very motivational very eye-opening and uh, a lot of us you know we've had stints with you know with uh, depression for some of us more serious than others and uh, i think this one's going to be great it's going to help out the community and uh stick around watch the whole show hope you guys enjoy guys welcome to another episode of the Corinda show here I have my guests what's up guys I'm Kevin Nahai <laughs> and uh yeah we're gonna thanks for having me Carlos no no thank you for coming thank you for being here uh it's a really hot day today and, 103 in LA yeah 103 no AC <laughs> <laughs> we're and suffering we have a fan but the fan we're using it for the computer so it doesn't overheat <laughs> <laughs> so yeah man let's, let's get it started now Tell us a little about yourself, brother. Sure. Uh, my name is Kevin. I'm 28, born and raised in LA. Um, I am a motivational speaker and a coach. I speak to audiences mostly ages, I would say, 20 to 35, 20 to 40. And I speak about emotional issues, um, anxiety, depression, body dysmorphia, disordered eating. I speak a lot about dating and relationships. I speak a lot about... Uh, anxiety I'm sorry a lot about self-esteem and self-confidence issues and I also run a one-on-one -on -one mentorship program kind of like a, a one-on-one -on -one coaching program and I work with people in their 20s and 30s and uh, you know the 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 whole point of what I do is to give people practical solutions of how they can actually make changes in their lives right. rather yeah. rather than just talking about like okay well here are all of my problems so I wanted to create something that actually helps them fix those problems. Correct. That's that's great. I really yeah. I mean, we need more of that in the world because <laughs> uh, as as you can see, uh, there's just a lot of negativity spreading out, especially in these moments. And and uh, when I saw your videos, I was like, man, this guy's just great. He's he's killing it. Thank you, man. Uh, like spreading that positivity and, and and that mindset, man. Like that. I feel like. Uh, uh, what, what do you think it is? What, what's what's going on with uh, with the with the people? Is it social media or or there, there's definitely a change, right? Like um, I feel like we have more. You mean more people depressed or more anxiety? At, at least I feel I never heard of this as much back then. Yeah, you're 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 absolutely right. I mean, the current pandemic has definitely exacerbated people's emotional issues, but. In general, the reason that I wanted to help this population, people, you know, I guess you could call them millennials, but people really ages, you know, 20 to 35, 36, is that I, I looked at this population, which you and I are both part of, and, and I studied them. And what I, what I realized is that next to World War II veterans, we are, I'm sorry, I'm sorry, next to Vietnam War veterans, we are the highest users of anti-anxiety and antidepressant pills of anyone in the country. Right. We have the highest suicide rate is right here in this generation. We are more depressed, less happy than we have ever been. And so there is something about this generation, you know, millennials that is deeply emotionally maladaptive we are generally really bad at having romantic relationships and we've got a lot of issues between the sexes men and women and the way we relate and the way we date and all that kind of stuff and you know of course it's not all doom and gloom there's there's a lot to be said for our entrepreneurship our creativity the fact that we believe in social justice you know all kinds of good things about this generation too right. but you know from an emotional perspective my question it was the same as yours which is why are people who are supposed to be at the prime of their lives 
so incredibly unfulfilled and depressed and unhappy. And so I, I set out a mission on a mission to to really change that and, and to fix that. And we can talk for hours and hours about what the causes of that is, yeah. whether it's from childhood or social media or, you know, parenting or schooling, pressure, financial issues, the economy, so forth and so on. But my question really is, where do we go from here? And how do we change that? That's great. That's, uh, that's rather than focusing, yeah, I mean, we do got to focus. Where is this coming from? But something we're ignoring is how do we deal with it? And uh, I feel like the solution is not just a pill. That's that's the, everybody wants a quick fix. Right. And uh, that's not the right way to go about it. Eh? Yeah, and I'm not, you know, I've been on psychiatric medication myself for my own issues. Mm -hmm. You know, I've been on antidepressants. I've been on anti-anxiety medications. It's, it's not that there's anything wrong with them, but that is something that will give you a little boost and it's something that will sort of act as a band-aid, but you can't put a band-aid over a battle wound. You have to figure out what's going on under the surface. Can, can you describe uh, for me and, and for other people who perhaps they can't relate, like, because, uh, yeah, like you said, you, you, you suffer from depression, you said? Or and anxiety, anxiety, yeah. Anxiety? That, like I said, um, that's something... I know I, 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 everybody suffered a little, you know, depression, but if you're saying uh, you took medication, I mean, it must have been more serious than others, I'm assuming. And uh, explain, explain that for us. Like, what is it that you feel or, you know, sure. and not just what you feel, but uh, how others can help, you know, people when you're in your position. So that way, you know, they, they don't get to that point where, where they're suicidal or something like that. Sure. You know? Like, yeah. how, how can we approach you or should we give you your own space? Let's That's a great, a bit about that. that's a great question. So, um, I, I've had three major emotional issues in my life. One is anxiety, another was depression, and a third was anorexia. I was severely anorexic during college. Um, you know, for at least two to three years, I was 70 pounds underweight. Um, I, I'm five foot nine and I was like 112 pounds or something like that. So very, very sickly. Yeah. And... Um, it's never just one issue. It's never just you're happy and your entire life is perfect, but you have depression. There is a confluence of factors with any sort of emotional maladaptive disorder, especially with eating disorders. Um, so what I'm saying is that everything is connected. And, you know, common symptoms um, can manifest themselves in different ways for each one of these disorders. Mm -hmm. But for me, like, for example, the, the giveaway that I was depressed is that I had no motivation to do anything and I would constantly sleep. Okay. So for some people, depression comes in the form of undersleeping uh, for, and, you know, using drugs and alcohol and things like that and staying up all night, um, skipping work, you know, things like that. For other people, it's the opposite where they feel incredibly unmotivated, unproductive, and they just sleep all day long. You know, that's like what I used to do in college on the weekends and things like that. I would just stay in my dorm and just sleep all day long because I had no motivation to get out of bed. Yeah. Um, anxiety, on the other hand, you know, manifests itself in, in, again, in different ways for different people. But some of the common symptoms of anxiety are that um, it's, it's a fight or flight or freeze response. Fight, flight, or freeze, which means... You either feel the need to get up and do something and fix the problem right away. That would be fighting. Or you feel the need to get up and run away from the problem, you know, escape from your issue. Yeah. That would be flying or flight. Or you're completely paralyzed. You can't even make a decision. You have no idea what to do. You're just freaking out. That would be freeze. And I've experienced fight, flight, and freeze um, anytime I've had an anxiety, you know, episode can come in the form of panic attacks. It can be heart palpitations. It can be sweaty palms, or it can just be something called generalized anxiety, yeah. which means that whenever you wake up in the morning or whenever you're going throughout your day, you just have this silent hum of anxiety. You're just always a little on edge. Mm -hmm. You don't feel calm. You're constantly waiting for the other shoe to drop. You know, just this, this, this undercurrent of feeling uneasy and unhappy, you know, is, is sort of how I would describe generalized anxiety. And then it can be triggered by whatever happens throughout your day. And was this something you would uh, feel on the daily, on the daily or? Yeah. 
Oh man, that's it's terrible. That's, that's terrible. And I and I don't even have anxiety that bad. Yeah. There there are some people that they're an anxious mess twenty four seven. Yeah. And they got to be on serious medications and things like that. Yeah, I'll, I'll tell you a little story for me for anxiety. <laughs> the only time I had anxiety, I had a like, I guess what you would call a panic attack or anxiety or anxiety attack. I don't know what they call sure. it. But uh, I only had one, and that was because I was writing uh, my report for for uh, I think it was uh, psychology, and uh, you know it was due in the morning. I had I, you know I was almost done, maybe you know one more page from completing my my essay and I don't, got know deleted. What, I don't know yeah exactly it oh, got deleted no. I hit some button wrong or <laughs> the whole thing deleted and I just start that was the first time in my life I was like what the hell is this like I really felt like I was having a heart attack I was like yeah like just this massive massive uh, feeling right here in my pit my chain my chest my chest yeah yeah and and it was intense but uh maybe it lasted maybe three minutes but mm -hmm. it, it was intense because I, I i just thought to myself I was like all right carlos like you know here stressing out about about this nothing's gonna happen so you need to get the fuck back on it and then mm. and start over i mean it, it sucked but uh and i think i only had like maybe six hours damn so i had to rewrite the whole thing and, and like luckily you know i i memorized most of it when i was writing it so sure so I was really blessed in that way that I was able to memorize it. So now there are people who have that feeling in their chest, yeah, to a lesser degree, all day long. Yeah, I was gonna say that. Like, and then there are people who that, who get that feeling. there are people who get that feeling in their chest in the form of a panic attack in the middle of the night every night. Yeah, you know, and most of those people are people that you and I know. They're in our generation. They're yeah. in our cohort. The anxiety of this generation is absolutely through the roof. And it permeates into every aspect of our lives. It permeates into career trajectory, into relationships, into um, uh, finances. It, it permeates into our relationships with our family. So, you know, there's sort of a debate about how much anxiety and depression are caused by chemical imbalances in the brain and in the body and how much they are caused by environmental external factors such as our upbringing or our beliefs or um, experiences you know, that we've had. Yeah, those stressful situations, those triggers. Exactly. Right. Exactly. So, you know, I think it's generally accepted that it can be a combination of, of both of those things, that it's both nature and nurture. It's, it's both your environment and... Um, you know, some issues with your physiology or your, your brain or how much serotonin you produce, so forth and so on. And I'm not an expert on the science of the brain and how that, you know, how all of that works. I mean, I, I know a little bit, but I think the point is, um, the point that I always harp on is that using medication is a tool to help get you out of the darkest and most scary place of your life, to help you, to drag you out of those holes. But it's going to drag you out of the hole a little bit. It's not going to solve any of the problems. Right. So um, even though your anxiety or your depression or whatever your emotional issue is might be caused by some sort of physiological factor, um, you're only going to solve it with external environmental changes, meaning changes to your behavior, right. changes to the way that you think. You're not going to solve it with a pill. So, and, and that's, and that's where I come in. You know, I tell my clients all the time, listen, if you're seriously depressed, like let's do an assessment. You need to go to a psychiatrist, things like that, you know, because replacing some of those healthy chemicals in your brain will help you. But I would say most of my patients are not people who have clinical diagnosed disorders. They're just people who have generalized anxiety or they're lost, they're confused, they have bad relationships. And those are people who really they need to make changes to the way that they think and the way that they behave they need to make those environmental everyday changes and a lot of them don't even need medication because within two to three months of adopting a different way of thinking and a different way of living yeah. they are well on their way they're well on their way to success and that's where you come in and <laughs> i can't take credit but <laughs> but but i wanted to to teach people the tools right right you know no yeah and then i'll uh, See, I mean, I'm not a doctor, so, but uh, as far as medication, you know, uh, that's something for me, 
I, I've always, uh, and not just to, to anxiety, but medication in anything, I always feel your, your, you know, human evolution has gone through this process fucking over thousands of years or wherever, how long humans have been alive. And I just feel like um, the, the brain is it's, it's so, so powerful, so strong. And it's like we go through these, you know, temporary, you know, lows. But like, as, as I said, our brain's so strong, I feel like eventually we'll pick up. And, and I feel by introducing medication, this is me, my personal... I don't know shit. I'm not a doctor. <laughs> um, I feel introducing medication. It's like you make somebody dependent on that rather than than uh, having the brain, you know, try to force itself. Like, hey, we gotta get, we gotta get back up. It's like you take this this pill. It's like an easy way out, and then you you just condition your brain to like, hey, you know, like this is gonna be our solution. We just gotta take this pill for us. Well, I I agree on the one hand, and I don't and I don't agree on the other hand. So. The part that, that I don't agree with or that maybe is a little bit of a slippery slope mm -hmm. is that there's a large taboo about taking medication because people, we think of it as like taking the easy way out or cheating or something like that. Yeah. Whereas if you had cancer, you wouldn't tell somebody, oh, don't take medication because that's the easy way out. You know, so for really serious clinical disorders, you do need medication yeah. to help you because otherwise the cards are stacked against you in terms of your brain function. Yes. But the part that I do agree with and, and where my focus is that the single most powerful tool every human being has in their arsenal is their mind. And I teach, I teach my clients about this and at first, you know, they think I'm being disingenuous. They think that I'm, you know, trying to explain to them some like woo-woo floating on a cloud, like weird meditation thing. It, it's not any of that. What I tell them is that the way you think and what comes out of your mind, your internal dialogue, will create the reality you experience. Yes. And to tell you the truth, I don't know how this works. I don't know if there is some weird Illuminati <laughs> or God or whatever who's monitoring the frequency of all of our thoughts all the time. You know, there's a book called The Secret, which says all kinds of weird stuff about, like, the the brain wavelength you send out. I don't know if any of that stuff is true or what, but what I can tell you from personal experience and from seeing my clients have the same personal experience, 10 out of 10 times, 100 out of 100 times, is that what you think is what you're going to get. If you think... I'm fat, I'm ugly, I'm unsophisticated, I'm unintelligent, I'm never going to have a relationship, so forth and so on, you are damn right. You will be fat. You will not continue your education. You will not have the relationship that you want. You will not grow spiritually, emotionally, physically, mentally. If you think to yourself, okay, I'm not in a great place right now, but no matter what, I'm going to do whatever it takes to have a relationship, to continue educating myself, to make money, to get where I want. If you can really convince yourself of that by repeatedly, repeatedly ramming that into your mind, yeah. you will get it. Yeah. I can't tell you when, but it's only a matter of time. Right. And so the most important takeaway when it, when it comes to thinking about the mind is that whatever you focus your attention on is what will grow. Whatever you focus your attention on is what will grow. If your attention is focused on how you're inadequate, on all of the problems that you have, on how you're never going to get what you want, that's what will grow. Literally, it will grow. That's what you will get. If your mind is focused on where you want to go, the work that you need to do, your vision for your future, having all the things that you want in your life, that's what will grow and that's what will appear in your life. Yeah, and, and I saw uh, one, one of your videos which was great, like um, you talk about uh, don't worry about what you don't have control of. And mm. I think that's great because I think so many of us, we, we have that issue. We, you know, we just start worrying about like all this stuff, it, even with the political climate, you know, we're so worried about what's going to happen with, uh, you know, with, with Trump and all this stuff. And in, in the end, we really... I mean, we, do have, we have a vote, but we don't really have right. a choice. You know, it's not really in, in our hands. I mean, we just, we, all we can do is hope for the best. That's the best thing you can do. And, uh, you know, things may not go the way for, for either the Democrats or Republicans or wherever you stand. 
but you just gotta learn to accept it, deal with it, and adapt. Exactly. Yeah, because if you just keep focusing on that negative, like you said, you're, you're gonna, you're gonna, not just that it was that the power of thought, you know. Yeah. You, you bring it into reality. Exactly. So, and if you're just thinking negative, you're gonna be negative. Exactly. Your whole, your whole and, life. And like with the political comments and the political debate, and you know, this person thinks coronavirus is the biggest deal in the world. That person thinks it's not that big a deal. You know, this person is for Trump, that person is for somebody else, and they start going at each other's throats and things like that. You know, everybody is always, to, to go back to the thing about control, everybody is always hankering for some semblance of control. It's like, I need to be able to control what you think so that I can feel that I'm right. I need to be able to control this debate so that I know that I'm right. I need to be able to impose my opinion upon you so that I, I feel that I'm right and I'm justified. And that's because our ego, the entire purpose of our ego, is to find different ways to convince itself that it's right. You know, the yeah. ego is like this, this narcissistic thing that needs to be right at all times and needs to have control over all situations and all people. Whereas if you meet a really peaceful person, a person who's tranquil and calm and knows how to listen, a person who has the things that they want in their lives, so forth and so on, those people, they have some ego, because if they didn't have some ego, they, they wouldn't be, you know, they wouldn't have reached the level of success that they have. Right. But those people never need to argue with you about anything. Because yeah. it's like, whatever your opinion is, that's great. Do I have control over that? No. Do I need to be right? No. Right. I have my thoughts, you have your thoughts. It's all good. And that is the, the state that I am constantly striving to achieve. Yeah. I'm not very good at it because I, like everybody else, wants to be right and I want to feel justified and I want to have control. I've always been a control freak. Sometimes your emotions uh, take over. Of course. Right. Of course. Yeah, for, for me, uh, and this professor, Professor Sneed, he, he changed my life. Uh, before I used to be, the, I was very like uh, angry or easy to get angry. Mm. And then he told me once, and then th th this, it was so simple, but it changed my life for the better. He said, uh, he's like, when you get mad, you're letting other people take control of your emotions. Mm. He's like, you can, you choose to be mad. Mm. He's like, you can either choose to be mad or you can choose to be happy. You know, no matter what they tell you, no matter what they say. And it was so simple, but like, that hit really deep. I was like, why the fuck am I getting mad? Like, right. you know, <laughs> and, and sometimes uh, I apply this in all my life and sometimes uh, I even apply this with my wife which which can, can cause even more friction with my wife because my, my wife, she loves to argue with me <laughs> or as I found out later on now that it's... Uh, it wouldn't it's, be marriage it's, it's, if you if she didn't love to argue with you. Right, right. <laughs> but I, I think I, I found out it's more of a... It's not the issue itself. It's about, you know, she wants to be heard. Mm. And I think that's that's what what I'm starting to get out of it now. Mm. And uh, yeah, so that 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 really just went up. I was like, man, why am I getting mad all the time over people's words? And it's like, you know, in a couple of years, I'm not gonna see these people. Majority of the time, you know. Yeah. Majority of people, you, you your friendships come and go. And, and, it's and like, even if you do see them, it's not your responsibility, your right, or your ability to change their mind. Yeah. You know, like. For some reason, we have this, and I'm very guilty of this, of course, but, you know, for some, for some reason, we, we learn this perception along the way that if somebody disagrees with us, we have the ability, we have the obligation, uh, and we have the right to change their mind, to fix them, to show them the promised land, to show them the way that things are supposed to be. And then when they're not getting what we're saying, we get angry. Yeah. And the thing that I've learned about anger, because I used to have a temper problem, to tell you the truth. I used to get, I used to have a very short fuse. You know, now I'll get anxious and I'll get emotional, but it's pretty rare that I get angry. Mm -hmm. And if I get angry and I notice my temper coming on, I, I've become much, much, much better at learning how to regulate that. That's great. And that's because the thing that I learned about anger is that there are, there are three phases. Phase one is the trigger. Somebody does something, somebody says something, and it pisses you off, okay? Phase two is your reaction. And phase three is the aftermath. Now, 
Phase one is something we have very little control over. Mm -hmm. We all get angry. We're all emotional creatures. If somebody says something that, that angers you and they trigger you and they push your buttons, you're going to get angry. Like, of course, you're going to feel that. And that's totally normal. You can't worry about that because you have no control over it. But phase two, which is the most important phase, is your reaction. How you react to them how you process your own anger and what you choose to put back out to them, right? right? So if you choose to clap back at them and you pop off on them, you've just lost. Yeah. You have capitulated to the trigger, right? You lose your temper on them the way that I used to do, unfortunately, which I regret, right? Then now you lost the game. It's like you 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 capitulated. Their, their trigger got the best of you, and now you just ruined your own day by reaction. Right. And then we move into phase three, which is the aftermath. And the aftermath is, fine, let's say you reacted poorly. Let's say you let your anger get the best of you. Okay, fine. In the aftermath, what are you going to do about it now? A day later, a month later, a year later. Some people are angry for 20 years after the original incident. Yeah. You've just spent 20 years or a week or a month or a year of your life of your precious time that you can never get back being angry about something that is probably so inconse inconsequential in the grand scheme of your life. And even if it's not inconsequential, even if it's, it's really important and, and had a, a really large impact on your life, again, the question is, are you hurting the person by being angry at them? No, they don't give a shit. You're hurting yourself. Exactly. Yeah, I was going to go to that. I was like, you're holding on to all this anger. Twin, like you said, 20 years, and the other person, he's fucking living his life. He's exactly. happy. He's happy. <laughs> and you're fucking, you're stressing over some petty shit. <laughs> exactly. So the way I like to describe that third phase of anger, the, the aftermath, is like it's, it's holding on to a hot coal a burning hot coal. You're waiting to throw the hot coal in the other person's face. You're just waiting. Yeah. I can't wait to burn your, your, your face with this hot coal. But what's happening in the meantime? You're burning your hand. Yeah. You're the one that's burning. Oh, I fucking love that energy, man. That's great. That's great. You know? Well known. Your hand is, is turning to ash and bone while you're waiting to throw the coal in their face, you know? Right. And so hopefully you never get to the aftermath, but the way you avoid getting to that third phase of anger is to control what happens in phase two, control your reaction. Yeah. And the thing that I found most useful in phase two is a principle called respond, don't react. Respond means you take 10 seconds, 60 seconds, 10 minutes to just do nothing. Somebody triggers you, somebody angers you, you shut your mouth, you walk away, you count down from 10, yeah. 10, 9, 8, or you count down from a minute if you have to. Whatever you have to do, then you can respond. Mm -hmm. You pause, you try to curtail whatever your instinct is, you know, however you originally want to react, and instead you respond. That way, it doesn't blow up into this whole thing and you don't have to hold on to that anger, you know, because if it's two people going head to head against each other, they're not going to say sorry. You're not going to say sorry, and both of you are just going to remain angry, and then nobody wins. And not, not even just that, uh, you know, so, some people they 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 enjoy getting you mad. They, yeah, they do. So if they, if they see you mad, like these idiots on Facebook. Yeah, yeah. If, I mean, they see you mad once, they're like, ah, let me repeat that again. And like I said, it comes back to that to that thing I learned from Professor Sneed. They're controlling your emotions. Right. And uh. <laughs> I remember, uh, I don't Dude, there's this girl on Facebook. I see her posts every day. She's either posting about like something political about the election or she's posting about COVID. Yeah. She only posts about two things and she posts uh, them every day. And then there's like 100, 200 comments. 80% of them are from her mm -hmm. just being pissed off and spitting vitriol at people and they're spitting vitriol at, you know, at each other. And, you know, it's like, how much of everyone's life did you just waste by by proliferating these angry spiteful posts do you think this is going to change the state of coronavirus yeah. no all this does is piss you off and piss everybody else off around you yeah. so and again people always have to convince themselves that they're right and that they're justified okay that's fine you can convince yourself but while you're doing that i'm off making money 
Like, while you're doing that, I'm being happy. I'm working on my relationships. I'm growing. Yeah. So. No, and then, uh, like I said, I, I, the best thing I learned to do was be selfish. That was one of the best things. And, mm. uh, what do you mean? In, in, in a good way, like, I'll explain. Uh, like, I always think about my body. Like, I, I, I you know, I always think of myself, my body as a temple. Mm. So, w when you get mad, people don't, you know, they always think of the emotional part, but they don't think about the physical. Mm. When you get mad or when you stress, your cortisol levels rise. That, that they shoot that, through the that, roof. That impacts you, you know, later on in life, you know, get heart attacks, things like that, right? So I always think of that, like, why am I going to get mad? Why this is going to affect, impact my health? Mm. So that, that's what, what I always go to. I was like, man, <laughs> I don't want to kill myself. That's how, I, that's how I try to think. I don't want to kill myself over some fucking comment. Mm. So I, I just let it go, you know, and, mm. and just move on to, to my, my thing, the next thing. Okay. Yeah. So. That's such an important piece about the, the physical impact because going back to what I was saying earlier with this generation having so many emotional issues and being anxious all the time, it really manifests in physical symptoms. Yeah. And people don't, don't see the connection between the mind and the body. Right. You know, but for example, when I was 19, my first semester of college, I was diagnosed with a chronic incurable disease of the stomach. My doctor... My family doctor sat me down. He said, okay, you have this disease. You will have it the rest of your life and it will never be cured. And I used to be, I was a very healthy person. You know, I didn't drink. I didn't smoke. I didn't, you know, have any issues. I was always athletic. So it took me years, years to figure out where this came from. And what I realized is that, you know, part of it's hereditary and part of it is, you know, due to, again, the physiology of, of our individual bodies. But the majority of the reason that I got that disease was that I had so many emotional issues, so much anxiety, so much stress throughout my childhood and my high school years that I had never ever addressed mm -hmm. that it finally manifested itself in a physical condition. And now whenever people tell me they have the flu or they tell me they got, they got a cold or they're telling me they have an autoimmune disease mm -hmm. or whatever it is, the first question I ask them is, what happened in the three days before you got this? Yeah. What, hap what has been going on for the last three years of your life, for example? And 99 out of 100 times, it, is, it can be correlated strongly to stress and yeah. to our, our, the emotional condition. Yeah, yeah and uh, I think that's the same reason. I, I, I was, for, for a moment, I was thinking, like, man, I need to go to the doctor because I really can't remember it a time in my life that I even had the flu. Mm. And, and Maybe because you're a happy guy. Yeah, like you said, because I, I, I don't really get too stressed out about it. I'm a happy guy. I'm always positive. And I, I think, like you said, that that correlates, that transmutes into um, to the physical, you know? 100%. And I've never been sick. And I was like, why the fuck am I not sick? Like, how come I don't get sick? And I think that's the answer, man. It's yeah. just... That's amazing. Yeah, I always have a, a positive mindset. And then even when, like, I feel like I'm gonna get a cold or something. I just snap out of it. I'm like, hey, like, don't be a bitch. Don't, don't, don't let it <laughs> overtake you. <laughs> like, I just yeah. have these little fucking games in my head. <laughs> yeah, that's how I deal with it. But you gotta understand, you're a unicorn. Mm -hmm. Ninety-nine percent of people did not win this sort of positivity lottery that you won, mm -hmm. which is you were just born a happy, ambitious, positive guy. You know, mm -hmm. the, most people out there were not just born with that ability. They either don't have it at all or they have to spend years and years building it, yeah. you know? So the thing you got to remember is that just because it's easy for you to snap yourself out of things and you don't get colds and you don't get flus and things like that, thank God, yeah. because you're always so upbeat and so positive, most people are not like that. Yeah. Uh, once they learn to become like that, then those physical ailments really start to dissipate. Like with my stomach disease... I spent years, four or five years, trying every medication under the sun. It wasn't until I got my ass in therapy and started making very, very serious changes to my lifestyle and my internal dialogue and the way I think and all of that kind of stuff that my stomach actually got better. And I'm going go a little bit back. Um, you said you had a eating disorder, right? Yes, that was different from my stomach disease. Was that cause... Did that eating disorder cause the disease or did the disease cause... Uh, what came first... The disease came first, okay. but what happened um, was that 
when I got the disease, I couldn't keep any food down. Mm -hmm. So I started dropping all this weight like crazy. Then I became very depressed because I had this disease and because I felt like I was dying. Mm -hmm. um, and I mean, in a sense, I was, I was dying. I was having every problem under the sun. Um, thank God I didn't die, you know. Um, but it was very serious when I first got diagnosed. And it made me super depressed. I would look in the mirror. I saw that I had lost all of this weight. I hated the way that I looked. Then I started to associate food with pain. I start thinking, oh, if I eat, I'm going to be in pain. My stomach's not going to be able to keep it down. You know, I started having all of these problems anytime I would use the bathroom. My digestion was all sorts of messed up, you know, so I just stopped eating. Yeah. Because that was the only thing that avoided pain. And was this something you, you always dealt with uh, since you were a child or, or did it like... Well, since I was a child, I had a very sensitive stomach, but never like this. Okay. Yeah, this was brand new. So it, it kind of developed over time. It got worse, you would say? It got worse over time, but it hit me like a ton of bricks my uh, first month at college. Mm -hmm. You know, it really was... The onset of it was not slow. The onset of it was very sudden. Yeah. So anyway, you know, I, I felt like my body had betrayed me. I felt sick all the time. I felt ugly. I, you know, was really pitying myself. I oh, felt man, depressed. You kidding it, man. You get all these fine girls, bro. <laughs> <laughs> not at the time, dude. <laughs> Thank you. But and and so and so basically that, you know, the physical ailment put me in such a dark place that it turned into depression. It turned into eating disorder. It turned into a lot of self-hate, turned into anxiety. And here's the thing that people don't understand. When you hate yourself, self-hate begets self-hate. It's not as if you look in the mirror and you say, oh, I hate what I see, so I need to make a change. Mm -hmm. You look in the mirror and you say, I hate what I see. This is terrible. And that makes you hate yourself even more. And when you hate yourself, you do things that reinforce hating yourself. Yeah. You destroy yourself. And so you get caught in this very deep, dark uh, cycle of self-destruction. It's like a drug addict. A drug addict is not happy. They hate themselves. They hate their lives most of the time. So the drug addict doesn't look in the mirror and say, you know what? Today's the day I'm going to make a change. Let me pull myself up by the bootstraps. I got this. No, they continue destroying themselves like I was. I continued starving myself and working out like crazy and doing all this stuff. Because you're reinforcing the behavior that hates your, that makes you hate yourself. Right. You know, you get stuck in this black hole. It's a permanent cycle. Exactly. Eventually, the drag addict gets to the point where they're sick and tired of being sick and tired. Mm -hmm. And I got to that point too. Eventually, I hit my rock bottom, and I was like, "All right, I'm ready to be done with this." And was this a a decision you made on your own? Is it something that was influenced by your friends and family? How, how, did, how did, uh, like I said, talk, well, talk, like I said uh, earlier, uh, what's the best way to go about Do we give you your own space oh, so yes. you can think about it? Or, or should we be there for you? Because oh. sometimes we, we, we don't know what to do with well, this course. I would say that it depends what the issue is. If you're dealing with someone who's depressed or if you're dealing with someone who has an eating disorder or if you're dealing with someone who's a drug addict, each one of those situations has its own you know, peculiarities in terms of how you approach the person who is suffering. Mm -hmm. But here's what I can say is true across the board. What is true across the board is that if that person is not ready to make a change, if they are addicted to their problem, addicted to being depressed, addicted to having bad relationships, addicted to their abusive partner, addicted to the drug. I've never seen it like that, but that's great that you... <laughs> If they are addicted to the problem, mm -hmm. you cannot fix them, you cannot change them. Don't abandon them, love them, tell them I'm here for you, tell them anything you need, I'm always here. But don't be bombarding them saying, you're too skinny, you need to get out of this relationship, I see that you're depressed, let's go. Like it, It's futile. It's mm -hmm. not going to do anything until they get to the point where they've hit their rock bottom and they're ready to make a change. Mm -hmm. So, and listen, man, the hardest thing in the world, God forbid this ever happens to you, hardest thing in the world is seeing somebody you love do something self-destructive. Yeah. Whether it's your brother, it's your friend, it's your wife, you know, I feel so terrible that my family watched me do something self-destructive and that they had to suffer and they couldn't do anything about it. 
But that's the truth. The truth is they didn't have any influence over my decision to get better. I had to get there in my own time. You know, and I've known many people who were drug addicted in their life. I've known many people who have had um, abusive relationships in their lives. And the story is the same for all of them across the board. They had to get to the place where they were ready to turn their lives around. And no amount of a family member or a friend saying, I'm worried about you, sped up the process. Yeah, and I, I had a friend. Who Does was, that make sense? Yeah, no, definitely. Because I had a friend, he, he's, uh, that he was addicted to heroin. Oh, shit. And uh, yeah, he, he, he told me, he's like, he's like the, only, the only reason I changed was because he's like, one day I just decided I don't want to do this no more. Mm. This is it. Like you said, he must have hit his rock bottom. Nobody else will change his mind. It's up to that individual to be like, all right, I'm, I'm done with this. Like, exactly. Let, let's get out of this shit. Yeah. And, you know, sometimes there are there are false, what's it called, a, a false negative um, or a false start, I guess, where a person is like, it's really easy to motivate yourself temporarily to mm -hmm. be like, all right, today's the day I lose weight. New year and new me. Today's the day I quit doing drugs. Today's the day I throw away this pack of cigarettes, whatever it is. Yeah. And then like 24 hours later, you're back to the same behavior. And then, okay, you go a week. And then a week later, you're back to the same behavior. And why does it happen? Like, why do people relapse on their self-destructive behavior? Mm -hmm. It's because they're not truly ready. You know, you have to get to the point where you are truly ready. And you're a very motivated person and you work very hard. So you, you can attest to this. It's one thing to work really, really hard on something uh, for four days or two weeks or a month. And then you lose steam and you go back to your old ways. You start hanging out with dumb people. You start smoking a little bit of pot here and there. And then before you know it, you're like living on your grandmother's couch. Yeah. It's another thing to stay motivated and stay committed to your goal every day for the long term. Yeah. That, excuse my language, is fucking hard. That is hard. And anybody who has been in that situation, like I still have to do things to make sure I never have an eating disorder again. Mm -hmm. I still have to do things to make sure my anxiety stays low. And anybody who has experienced that will tell you the rent is due every day. Seven days a week, if you want to keep up the quality of your life, you don't get any free passes. You never get to a place where you're like, okay, today I'm good. Today I can fuck around and throw my life down the toilet. Tomorrow I'll, you know, diet starts tomorrow. Yeah. just doesn't work that way. I was going to say, uh, I don't know if you do this with your clients or apply it for yourself. I think well, this is, for, for me, my secret to why, why I'm, I'm always so positive is uh, through habits, you know. Mm. You, you set up little goals and, uh, like, like, for me, for when I, before, I would start something and, and I would just never finish it. I had such a fucking huge problem with that. And now what I do, I'll, I'll write my goals down, I write them down, and then I just... Every morning, I read it. Before I go to sleep, I read it. And I feel like I've accomplished so much more doing that. Mm. And uh, like I said, it's because I developed a habit. So mm. I, I, I feel like perhaps other people can can adopt that. And just, you got to create habits. And and uh, it goes back to that uh, the power of thought, you know? Like, <laughs> you wake up in the morning, you see that, you read to yourself, like, fuck, like, I'm, I'm working on this. Guy. That sets I'm, the tone for your whole day. Yeah, it sets, exactly. It sets the tone for the whole day. And when you go to sleep, man, like, you know what? I'm, I'm not here yet, but fuck. I will I'm, be. I'm one step closer. Right. You know? Right. And, and, and that's that's how that's how I do it. Like, setting these these habits, that's what, what it's really important that you need to do. And what's a habit, dude? A habit is something you do every single day. Mm -hmm. A habit is something you do, let's say your habit is going to the gym. You get your ass up and you go to the gym when you're tired. You go on Christmas. Yeah. You go, you know, unless you've designated a day that is like your rest day or whatever, you get your ass up and you go. You go when you feel like it. You go when you don't feel like yeah. it. Why? Because that's the only recipe for success. Yeah. The rent is due every day. You know, and uh, by the way, about habits, there's a great book called Atomic Habits. Mm -hmm. um, I wish I wrote it, but I did not. <laughs> um, Atomic Habits really helped me implement some great new habits in into my own life but you know what you're saying is exactly what i teach my clients and what i talk about there any anything you want to get in your life it comes down to two things the way you think the way you behave you change the way you think you will change the way you behave 
You change the way you behave, you will change the way you think. Yeah. If you alter those two variables, what goes through your mind all day long and what you actually do, that is how you change your life. That is how you get the things that you yeah. want. Well, I definitely agree. Yeah, because you can just loathe and put yourself in a pity party and, you know, it's just going to be self-destructive. Oh, and the pity party thing. Don't get me started on the people throwing themselves pity parties. Yeah. It's, yeah, but, uh, I, I mean, it, it's great what, what you're doing and uh, I really appreciate it. And I'm sure your, your, your customers or the people you work with, they appreciate it. So Thank you, man. Man, it's... Let's see how how we uh, overcome this, man. Because uh, yeah. I, I feel like it's a an issue that keeps growing. And but you know, you've you've had your fair share share of challenges in your own life. Oh yeah, I mean, definitely, definitely. So you're this super happy, upbeat, positive guy. But you know, you've you've overcome your own adversity too. Yeah, uh, th yeah. And uh, and like I said, it, it, it just for me, it came down to changing my my mental state, my my mentality. And, and creating those habits and once you do that you know you just it, you put yourself in a cycle mm. <laughs> that's the best way i can say it. and uh and uh the thing i learned to differentiate is uh simple and easy mm. so i feel life is really simple but it's not easy it's not easy dan pena says that oh does he say that yeah I, i've never heard that from him but i was like man like I, I just learned that it's like he says i'll tell you i'll tell you idiots what to do yeah. it's simple but it ain't easy oh does he say that yeah <laughs> yeah, yeah. I, I love that thing man that that guy is uh I, I think that's the whole reason i got into napoleon hill because of that pain uh -huh. so yeah yeah well, you want to talk about a little bit about that thing man sure man yeah, yeah. Like, yeah. for me uh like that my and Napoleon Hill is a G2. Think and Grow, which is a book every single person should read. Yeah, they should. They should. Yeah. Hold on. Uh, can I get you another drink? Because I know it's hot in here. Yeah, sure. <laughs> yeah. Thank you. Thank you, bro. You got it. Brought to you by Gatorade. <laughs> Gatorade, send the check for this free advertising. <laughs> Mexican water. <laughs> Send the check. <laughs> Send the check. <laughs> How'd you get into Dan Pena? Uh, oh, oh. So with Dan Pena, I, um, I was watching uh, Joe Rogan because I, I, I love his show. Joe his Rogan. Podcast? Yeah, his podcast. It's the best. It's fucking great. And, uh, it's hilarious too. Yeah. No, actually it wasn't Dan Pena. Uh, it, wasn't, uh, it wasn't Joe Rogan. It was, uh, I don't know if you're familiar with Vlad TV. Vlad? No. Yeah, yeah. He does like a lot of, uh, hip he mostly does hip hop stuff. Okay. But uh, he had this uh, one special guest uh, talk about wealth, which was Dan Pena. Mm. And uh, for me, it was, I just saw him cuss so much. <laughs> and, and I cuss a lot, so I was like, wait, what? Like, you can be wealthy and fucking just be a loud mouth like that? Yeah. I was like, holy shit. And uh, <laughs> he just got my attention, you know. He, he's so charismatic. He's a, he's a character, man. He's hilarious. Yeah. He, he, I mean, he's kind of crazy, but. Yeah, he's crazy, but I love it. My, my wife, the first time I showed him to my wife, because he does the the online seminars too, uh -huh. I think. And uh, I, I sat down with my wife, like, hey, let's watch this. And I, I just fell in love with it. I was like, whoa, like, this guy, he knows what the fuck he's doing. And yeah. and, and and he's from East LA, and, and, and he's coaching all these billionaires. I know. And I was like, holy shit, like, that's someone I can relate to, man. Like, that, that, I was like, he's from East LA. He's a, a Mexican American. His dad was a cop. He grew up in the barrio. Yeah, he grew up in the barrio. It, you know, his his parent his or his mom was an immigrant, and so I I could definitely relate. And I was like, huh, like there is people who can fucking do it. If he can do it, like why can't I? Anyone can do yeah, it. Yeah, anyone can do it. And uh, yeah, that 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 just completely blew my, my wife to this day. She hates him. Why? Because he he's a uh, obnoxious. He, no, no, no. He he he. He cusses so much, and like I guess she doesn't like how he carries himself. Mm. And she noticed that I started to adapt oh, <laughs> the, way, the way he is. And like, because it's true. Like um, before, around my wife, like I kind of like censored myself. Mm -hmm. You know, it was more of a respect. But then, like in the inside, I was having this conflict. And I was like, man, I can't be myself. Like, and I was like, this is not, this is not good. Can't so, be your usual dog self. Yeah. <laughs> 
but uh, you know, luckily she, over over time, she's she's learned to to accept it more. She said, "All right, this is him, and like I can't change him." Mm-hmm. So, so that's why I love her. She's she's a great girl for that. She she just lets me be, and she's so supportive of of, every, of everything I did. Like um, starting this, I was like, "Hey, uh, so I'm, I'm gonna spend you know this amount of money on this," and she didn't say, "Oh, why?" So wow. She, she's just like, "Yeah, if you, if you think it's something you're, you're, that's gonna be great for you, do it." It has the best, like it's the best type of sport you can have. Just someone who's like, all right, if you know, and if you know something great, then go for it. They believe in you. Yeah, and then um, she also uh, and th- this was such a great thing. She she, she always told me she's like um, that I always have the final say. Mm. And I was like, how many women you know can say that? Like, no, like, it's very like, rare. Yeah, very rare. And she, she's like, you know, you're the man of the house. You know, like whatever you decision. You, get, you make for this family that's the, the final decision and I was like damn wow I'll put a ton of pressure but I think it's a, it's a good type of pressure no woman has ever said that to me no yeah, no. yeah. It, it really blew my mind when she told me that and, uh, but you know what that what that says is that she's looking to you to be the leader and that's uh, it's really flattering it's a huge it's responsibility but it's also a huge compliment mm-hmm. you know because because she's deferring the leadership and the vision to you right and you know, she she knows that you can do that. Yeah, yeah. So that's that's awesome, man. Yeah, it's it's really great. And uh, talk about a little bit about uh, about uh, your love life, man. Like how no. how how's that? Uh, uh, well, were, were you ever did, did you ever have a girlfriend when you were when you were going through these uh these issues? Or? Um, I had a girlfriend as I started to get better. Mm-hmm. So the first two three years, no, mm-hmm. it was like. It was impossible for me to date. I was just in a terrible place. Yeah. Um, around 21, 22, I got a girlfriend in college. Mm-hmm. Um, she really supported me. She really helped me get through all of my challenges. I ended up dating her for four years. Um, and she's a great girl. We're, we're not together anymore. We, we broke up several years ago. But um, yeah, we were together a long time. That's definitely my longest relationship. And then, you know, since then I've had a couple relationships, one, two, three months here, one, two, three months there. Um, During quarantine, during this COVID thing, my dating life was absolutely non-existent. I think I went on like one date over the course of like four or five months. Um, But very recently I met a girl and just started going out with her and that's going really great so far. So we'll, we'll, we'll see where it goes, but... You know, I was with her last night, actually, and I, I was I was talking to her about the fact that my whole life, I've always just been a relationship person. Like, even when I was in those phases of my life where I was just messing around, like sleeping with girls, dating random girls, things like that, I didn't like it. Yeah. You know, it didn't make me happy. I, I've always been the type of guy who wants to be in a committed relationship and feels happiest you know, when I'm sharing my life with somebody else. So, you know, God willing, I'll be able to do that very soon and get married and have ch- children and, you know, all of that stuff in yeah. in the right time. But, you know, I think an important takeaway is to learn, like, what is your true essence? What type of person are you? You know, are you a committal person or are you a non-committal person? And if you're a non-committal person, you want to change that because it's not going to make you happy. Yeah. And if you're the type of person that wants to be in a committed monogamous relationship, then find the right one and get yourself in it because you're leaving money on the table. Basically, you know, what I always tell people is you can't deny your essence. You cannot deny who you are. You can't deny your personality. You can't deny the types of things that are going to make you happy. You can't deny what's going to bring you personal fulfillment in your life. And, you know, you just, you can't even really change it. There are certain parts of who we are that we are born that way yeah. and you have to accept it and embrace it and is, is there anybody you go to like for uh, your, your love advice or 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 how, how do you go about that yeah me you, you yourself Myself. <laughs> <laughs> no i mean i was in therapy for seven years um i learned a lot of good good tools and stuff from my therapist um but you know, once I started coaching people and giving talks and stuff, after I did all of my research, of course, and spent spent years testing out my different like theories and stuff, I tested them all on myself. 
Like what I tell my clients about love and relationships and dating and things like that, I live those values. Yeah. You know, and, and I've learned, I've also been through it, man. I've been in terrible, toxic relationships. I've been in great, blissful relationships. I've been single. I've been committed. I've been a playboy. I've been a good boy. You know, I've done it all. Yeah. And I've learned patterns, what makes people happy and, and you know, what messes them up. Yeah. Um, but of course there are still some, and I'm not currently in therapy, but there, there are still some resources that I turn to all the time, and, and the best resources for me are books. Yeah. You know, I'm always reading books about love, relationships, sex, dating. Um, I mean, I'm always reading books about every area of expertise that I try to work on. Yeah. No, yeah uh, for me, uh, well, before I go to me, <laughs> I noticed this trend that, uh, especially from uh, amongst our peers, you know, our, our age group, because a lot of people come up to me like, "Wow, you're like, like you're married? Like mm -hmm. you're surprised? Like, like you're not even thirty yet, man?" And mm -hmm. I was like, "Man, I'm married. I'm happy." And they're like, "Well, how do you do it?" And uh, I've I've always, I always looked up to my parents because I think they're going on forty five years of marriage already. Wow. Yeah. So that's amazing. Yeah, it's great, and uh, I, I just I'm blessed, you know, to have some good teachers. <laughs> <laughs> and I, I feel like the biggest mistake people do when they when they ask for you know advice or something is they go to their friends who are single and it's like why the fuck are you gonna ask relationship person. advice from a single person like, right. there's there's single for a person as well you know well the the biggest mistake people make that's in, in a similar vein is girls go to their girlfriends for advice about men mm -hmm. yeah and men go to their male friends for <laughs> advice about women. Are you a woman? Yeah. Do you know how a woman thinks? And they're single. Yeah. <laughs> it's like you could not choose a worse person to go to. To yeah. you know, so with every one of my clients, and and I would say at least seventy five percent of my clientele are single women. Yeah. Single women who want to get into committed relationships. You know. My clientele leans kind of over age 25, like between 25 and 35, and a lot of them are not in relationships. Mm -hmm. And th they always say that my advice blows their mind because it's directly the opposite of what their dumb girlfriends tell them. Yeah. I'm like, no, no, no. You're going to the worst person for advice. Right. Your girlfriends who are not men, who don't know what men want, who don't know how men think, and they're single. They're not even in relationships in th themselves. Right. And guys do the same thing. It makes no sense. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, so that that's a uh, I, I always and it and you don't just apply it to love like you can apply it to any facet of life you know if, if you don't go to a poor person trying to find out how to become a billionaire exactly that, that's what I was gonna tell you like for me trying to create wealth I'm not gonna go to a poor person like hey man what not to do <laughs> you, you want to go to the person who's done it right and, and, right and same thing with a love life or any other thing that you're trying to achieve yeah yeah but you know let me ask you a question about getting married young mm. um. Or, I don't know if it's a, a question, but it's a comment, and then I, I want to hear your thoughts on this. So, I've always seen that there are two types of men out there. Um, at least two types of men who want to get married. Let's put it that way. Type one is a man who says, I'm not where I want to be yet. I'm not maybe 100% financially stable. Don't have everything I want. But I want to find a woman who's going to stay by my side, who sees my ambition, who sees where I'm going and I want to start building my life with her you sound like that type 2 is the guy who says I need to have a house I need to have cars and I need to be financially stable before I can even think about marriage right. you know guys who don't want to date seriously until they know that they can provide that life mm -hmm. you know so I've always wanted to be type 1 I've always wanted to be that guy that has a girl that you know, I can get married to her young, I can have children young, and we can build our wealth together, and she can, you know, stay by my side, and, and we can grow together, right. rather than waiting until I'm 40, until I'm, you know, and, and at that point I can say, oh, look at all this stuff that I have, now I can get myself a little wife and, you know, put her in my house, and, you right. know. Right, and then, yeah, when I feel like uh, when you get older also, uh, once you get, like you said, you, you have the money, the house, whatever, all these riches, um, you you start thinking like, was well, this girl with me because of 
what I have my possessions. Mm, interesting. As opposed from as opposed to me, like I think I'm in a great position because, like I said, uh, I'm gonna grow with her. So I, you know, it's not that that thought's never gonna be in my head. Like, oh, this she's only with me because of mm. what I have. And and you got married while you were bussing tables at a restaurant, right? Right, right, right. So she married you when you had nothing. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Exactly. Wow. So that's unbelievable. Yeah, it, it, she's she's a great person, and uh, and she already had completed her 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 career. She went to a uh, Universidad de Guadalajara, and she became a chief nurse. Wow. So, that, you know, it was a little a little bit intimidating because she's like, man, like, I I'm. I'm I haven't gotten my stuff together yet. Mm. <laughs> I mean, I, I completed my school. Uh, I, I got my pharmacy. My, uh, what's it called? Can't even think. But I worked at a behavioral hospital. Mm. And I guess. Might be my wife. <laughs> yeah. But, uh, yeah, uh, what, what was I going with this? That you were a little intimidating, uh, intimidated yeah. at first because she had her her life together and you were still exactly. working. Exactly. And, and I think it also... It rubbed off on me, you mm. know, her her mindset. She and helped you grow into she, that. Exactly, she helped me grow. And, uh, and seeing her complete something, and I was like, man, I can I can complete, you know, whatever my dream is. Because mm. her dream really was nursing. Mm. And, uh, you know, in Mexico, you, it might not be the most uh, rewarding as far as financially. But she's happy because it, it was something she wanted to do. She wanted to help people out, and nobody's going to take that away from her. So. Yeah, man. She, she's she's happy and you know so and that, that's the important part just being happy and that's my wife saying hello checking in <laughs> not, not a girl not, not with the girls <laughs> it's just me yeah, it's just my boy um, proof. <laughs> but you know that that thing about it might not be the most financially rewarding but it makes her happy yeah I want to be a very wealthy person you want to be a very wealthy person we, ha we both have high ambitions and things like that and, you know, that's great, but I've noticed this huge problem in the sort of psychology, self-help, personal development area. I, I think that there's a really dangerous message going around, which is be the best, do the most, make the most money, be your absolute best, fulfill your potential, do everything, become the queen of the universe, become the king of the world, blah, blah, blah. And... It takes a very extraordinary type of person to have not only the drive to do that, but the ability to do that. Mm -hmm. And God willing, I'll be an extraordinary person, but I don't know. You know, I, I don't know what's, what's, how my life is going to turn out. But that's why they call them extraordinary, because they are extraordinary, because they're not ordinary. Yeah. And most people out there don't need those things in order to be happy. Most yeah, yeah. people out there need a good job, they need to live comfortably, they need to have good long-lasting relationships, healthy family, healthy kids, and that will be enough for them. And so a message that I try to spread is do less, like do what's going to make you happy. Drop this expectation you have of yourself that by age whatever, you need to be the partner at, the, at a law firm, you need to have a house in Beverly Hills, you need to have three kids, you need to have a Range Rover, and you know, that somehow like, that's gonna, that's gonna make you happy and that's what's gonna bring you know, fulfillment into your life. And so this problem that I'm describing is that we are constantly conflating achievement and fulfillment. Mm -hmm. We're constantly thinking that achieving things receiving accolades, having accomplishments under your belt is going to bring you fulfillment. Right. That if I fatten up my resume, if I have more money, if I have this title, blah, 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 that somehow that's going to make me emotionally fulfilled. Yeah. It's going to fill up my heart. It's going to fill up my soul. And it's just not true. It's just not true. If you want to feel fulfilled in life, you have to do things that bring joy to your heart. Right. And those things are growing those things are having good relationships. Those things include making positive contributions to other people's life. You know, it's very rare that a person who has all the money and all the riches in the world is also extremely emotionally fulfilled. Right. You know, most of those people end up being the richest person in the graveyard. Yeah. 
And there's nothing wrong with being rich. I want to be rich. But I don't make the mistake of thinking that if I'm super achieved and super accomplished, that's also going to make me fulfilled because yeah. they're, they're different sciences. Yeah, I'll, I'll, and I'll say two things about that. Um, I, yesterday I was reading a book from uh, Robert Kiyosaki. Mm -hmm. I think it's uh, Rich, Rich Dad Poor Dad. Yeah, yeah. And I, I, didn't, I didn't even know this, but uh, apparently Charles Schwab, who purchased uh, the steel company, steel company from uh, Andrew Carnegie, uh -huh. he ended up dying poor. Damn. And, and I was like, holy shit, like, I, I never knew it, and especially because you know you see Charles Schwab, Charles Schwab. The first thing you think of is money, or you of know, course, stock, the bank. Yeah, the bank, all that stuff, right? But I didn't know he died broke, and I was like, oh shit, like that that blew my mind. And Robert Kiyosaki, he was talking about, um, I guess there was this meeting, and you know some of them died broke, another another uh, people, they died like as uh, as ended up poor farmers. Mm. Others uh, committed suicide because mm -hmm. of the Great Depression, mm -hmm. and uh, I see those similarities, especially with the with how the economy is, is looking out right right now. And you see, you know, a lot of these people they seem to be happy, but they're only happy because of the money. But mm -hmm. once that money is gone, like then what? What's gonna happen? Yeah, and for for me, I want to create wealth. But for me, the, the money is not what's gonna bring me happiness. For me, I'm a curious person. Right. And, and I just love to travel. I love to try different things, and that, and I feel the money will will supply that. Will, yeah, will help me fulfill my curiosity. Right. So, and there's also there's also a difference. There's an important distinction in how you make your wealth. Yeah. So if you're making tons of wealth because you're making a positive contribution to somebody else's life, you're educating people, you're creating a product that makes life better for people, mm -hmm. you know, you're uh, whatever, you accumulate all of these riches because you found a way to make life better for someone else, you deserve all the riches in the world, yeah. you know? But if your sole mission is to make all of this money to fulfill your ego and you do it by being like an investment banker who works like a hundred hours a week and never sees their wife and never sees their kids and you know it's just like you're money hungry all the time shit's not going to make you happy yeah, it's not. you know and 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 that money what money is that what what is it worth you work so much anyway all you can do is go to the hamptons like once every six months and be with all of these other people who are just as unhappy as you are yeah so you know and you know like you said i you can have all these girls, but you know, I, I went through that phase as well. You know, I was dating so many different girls, and and my boys, they'd be like, "Hell yeah, man! Like you're, you're fucking dating all these fine women and all that." You're shit. killing it. And for me and myself, I was like, "Well, I'm, I'm not like I'm not fulfilled." Like, and you know, now I, I'm I'm married. You know, I'm just with one person, but I'm the happiest I've ever been, man. Right, like, man. I'm, I'm like I said, fulfilled. Yeah. And uh. Now I'm just working on the, the financial part. <laughs> right, exactly. And I, and I am too. I, you know, I'm, I'm like that too. I always tell people, look, man, if you want a business coach or you want to find out how to 10x your business, don't come to me because I don't know. I'm figuring that out on my own. I have a business coach. His name's Jeremy. He's incredible. Yeah. Um, you know, and, and I, I pay him to help me sort out that aspect of my life. I can't tell people how to make money. I can teach them how to find fulfillment. Yeah. I can teach them how to find relationships. I can teach them how to turn a tragedy into a triumph. I can teach them how to fill up their soul. I can teach them gratitude. I can teach them better habits. You know, if you want to find out how to go make money, you know, read all these great big books, listen to Grant Cardone and all these other big wigs, hire a business coach, you know, do whatever you have to do. But and, and, and be careful who, who you're looking up. Like you said, Grant Cardone. I, I, for for a minute, I was falling into his his thing, you know, like because he's like, he's very charming. And, sure. Uh, and I'm seeing with, with the with the whole eviction process and all this stuff, like, or the whole the uh, was it what did we have here in LA the the holding of the moratorium, of, of, red moratorium, red moratorium, that that impacted his his uh, business and he started firing a bunch of people. Bunch oh of shit. Staff. Yeah. And so you got to be careful who you who you look up to, like like you said, it's not just money. You right. Got, you got. And, and that's what the thing I love about Dan Pena. He doesn't just go into business with people who have money, because you know almost anybody can can make money. He just goes into business with extraordinary people. Yeah, he and he hires private investigators to see their personal life, see who they really are. Right. Because, like I said, th that 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 account you can inflate it. Right. But your character is always gonna be you. Exactly, and that's that's 
you know, that's what I was going to say is you can listen to Grant Cardone. You can listen to, if you don't like him, somebody else, you can listen to Gary Vaynerchuk. I don't know. Any Warren Buffett, any of these super rich people, mm -hmm. whatever, go hear what they have to say. But learn how to be fulfilled. Learn what's going to make you happy because there are patterns. Human beings are all the same. Doesn't matter if you live in Fiji. Doesn't matter if you have 10 gazillion dollars or $10. Yeah. All human beings, there are certain tenants that make us happy and certain tenants that make us unhappy. And it is on you to learn what those are. And so, you know, I'm still a nobody. I'm still a baby in this industry. But, you know, I, I try to teach people those things from my own personal experience and from what I've seen work. And I tell people all the time, and for anybody who listens to this show, message me anytime. My line is always open. I talk to people for free every single day. Get on the phone with them. Don't charge them a dime just so I can get the ball rolling for them. Yeah. But you would be shocked, Carlos, how many people don't even take the first step of sending a message. It takes two seconds to send a message. Yeah. You would be shocked how many people won't spend 15 to 30 minutes on the phone with somebody who might potentially have the ability to make their lives better. Right. Why? Because we get addicted to our problems. Yeah. We get addicted to that cycle of negativity and the same stuff, you know, same self-destructive behavior perpetuating itself in our lives over and over again. And, you know, it's, it's like, ultimately, man, I can't make you do anything. Ultimately, yeah. you are going to be in control of your destiny and what you get in your life and how you feel and what you think. And I'm a tool, but you got to take the first step and reach out. Yeah. And, and for me, uh, I was wasting so much time on social media before. <laughs> like, oh, oh, my goodness. Yeah, like, it's useless. It's so addiction. And then uh, that's why I started this podcast, too, because I was like, I spent so much fucking time on this that, like, rather than wasting my time on it, like, let, let's let's find a way to make this beneficial to me. Right. So that's why I started the podcast. Is like, and... Um, when people message me, it's like, it's kind of like business. Like, yeah, it's still my friendships and everything. But now, now I don't, I don't feel like oh, I'm fucking wasting my time on social right. media. Now I feel right. like, oh, I'm adding to, to adding to value, or whatever. Yeah, yeah. Adding value. And that's great. So it's like you also, it's important to find something you may think is a weakness. Learn how to adjust and and make it work for you. Make it your strength. Make it your strength exactly. And I think that's something I did, man. <laughs> so proud of you, man. I appreciate it. Love it. <laughs> Love it. Yeah. Uh, let's go back. Sorry, we had a, a blackout <laughs> with this heat. Oh my God! Anybody who's in LA this weekend, yeah, yeah. it's it's rough out here. Yeah, yeah, it is it's tough. And uh, but you know what? It's also beautiful. We're so lucky we live here. Yeah, my my, my sister-in-law she lives in uh, in Texas. Yesterday it was one seventeen. Oh my God! So yeah, I mean it's not as bad as here, I guess you could say. And yeah, it's not as bad as over there. Yeah. I always try, you know, whenever I'm feeling like, oh, it's so hot or the world is so shitty or, you know, whatever, whatever. I think just one thing that's really helped me is the simple practice of saying, okay, but what are you grateful for in this moment? You know, and that's why I caught myself. I was complaining about the heat. And then I said, but you know what? I'm so lucky I live in Los Angeles. It's beautiful here. 360 days a, w a year, yeah. you know, out of 365. And, and, and just that, that simple practice, again, what you put your attention on is what will grow, yeah. you know? So that simple practice of, what am I grateful for today? Hey, you're, you're saying you're happy, but wait till that earthquake hits, man. Oh. Uh, it's coming, it's coming. Right now? Oh, well, you're about to speak to a seismologist, yeah, yeah, yeah. No, right? Yeah, I'm speak to a seismologist, so, so we'll talk about, uh, see how, how soon we are to get in that. It's crazy, I was also seeing that, uh, I guess they, they can predict, I didn't know this, but the, they can predict like an earthquake like 30 seconds before, and I guess send an alert. You know who can predict an earthquake 30 seconds before? Who's My that? dog. Really? Gus starts barking his ass off like crazy, like 20, 30 seconds before the earthquake happens, really? and then an earthquake hits hey. every time. Hey, maybe that's what the guys at Caltech are doing. They just have a, they just have a, a kennel little, right there. A little dog. <laughs> a super was, smart dog. Yeah, yeah, once he starts barking, like, oh, yeah. send out the alert. <laughs> hey, man, if you want to learn how to be happy in your life, you got to start by getting a dog. Yeah, oh, yeah, definitely. Yeah. <laughs> I had my dog for 15 years, man, and... He's the best. He's, he's the best. Uh, I love that guy. Why don't you tell everyone the name of... your The uh, the politically incorrect name of your dog. Uh-uh. My, my dog's name is Blackie, but uh, it's because <laughs> he's all black, literally. Oh, I used to have a... I don't think you can call a dog Blackie. Well, it was 15 years ago, man. <laughs> 15 years ago. I'll tell you why his name is Blackie. Okay. Because uh, 
I used to have his, his his brother with us as well, and he was all gray, so I called him Smokey. Mm. And uh, I guess keeping with the tradition of basic names, <laughs> we, we really couldn't think of, of, a, of a name. Now so you have to get a white dog named Whitey. Whitey. <laughs> we cut... Yeah, we had a brown dog named Brownie. Now I think of Brownie. Brownie? Yeah, oh yeah, my we God, had a wow. brown dog named Brownie. So there you go. We just name them based on the colors. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, but uh. So what do you uh, what do you think about all of this, all this stuff in the? Because I said you can't call the dog Blackie because he's politically incorrect. Right. But and Dan Pena is is always saying that political correctness is the disguise of of insecurity, or if if you're politically correct, it means you have low self esteem. Yeah. So, so what do you think about all of that? As far as uh, about political correctness and all that? Yeah, and you know, you, you can't say certain things, you can't do certain things, you know, you'll, you'll get canceled. No, just, uh, honestly, I think people can tell when you, you know, genuinely, they can tell when you're being, you know, um, malicious or when you're trying to hurt somebody. And uh, I, so I, I really don't, don't, uh, don't really wor worry too much about other people's words, thoughts. Because like I said, like you're never going to have everybody satisfied. There's always going to be someone who hates you. Some, and uh, But do you censor what you say? No, I, 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 I used to, but uh -huh. not, not, not anymore. And, and so if somebody asked you, for example, what do you think about Black Lives Matter? Or what do you think about coronavirus? Or what do you think about uh, this or that? Yeah, let's you, talk a little bit about Black Lives Matter. Um, I, I feel like... I mean, I'm not... Uh, I don't talk about political stuff, no, but no, no. But I'll tell you though something about that. Uh, I think a, a a huge issue is people are forgetting to separate the words from a movement because they are two separate things. Like the words black, from like, what the movement? Yeah, like because there's a political ploy as well. Of course. So when you say black Black Lives Matter, as as a as a word, like yeah, like, hell yeah, I support I support Black Lives Matter. I I, I support you know. You know these people because of all the everything that they've gone through but at the same time and it's become it's becoming this thing where people can't differentiate there's also another thing the black lives matter it was a movement where they're just trying to change history or or, or, or things like that like i said it's a, a political ploy and i think we're having an issue differentiating the the two of them mm. And, and I think it's unfortunate that, uh, you know, that a, a party or, or political, whatever political, they're trying to hijack, you know, a word or a saying. So, I mean, I think you can kind of say also is with, uh, like, the word gay. Mm -hmm. <laughs> like, you know, back into the 50s, or we would see the Flintstones, we would have a gay old time. Oh. It's just ha happy. And then, like, you say gay now, like, you know, for some people, they might, like you say in Texas, <laughs> they might be political lgbtq and all this stuff and uh i don't know it, it, it it's it's weird how words get can get hijacked uh, i think that's what i'm trying to say how words can get hijacked mm. and just become this whole other thing even though it means this what do you think about this idea of not offending people like for example you can't you you can't uh, I, oh, i'll let you finish uh, go ahead no, like, so the reason that you can't use gay as a derogatory term mm -hmm. is that it's derogatory to gay people and it's it's rude to gay people and mm -hmm. it's offensive. Right. So, you know, that I understand. And I, don't, I never use the word gay as a derogatory slur. Okay. Because it doesn't make any sense to anyway and it's mm -hmm. not nice. But then there are other things that, like, for example, you're not, you're, like, you're not allowed to say that, you know you're not allowed to say that like sex is the same as gender mm -hmm. or that like there are men and women now like now you have to say a person who identifies as a man you're not allowed to say a man right. so then there are other things that like you know whatever you say is going to be misconstrued as as racist or sexist or misogynistic you know or insensitive so you can't say anything because you're going to offend someone mm -hmm. Oh uh, yeah. Well, for me, like I said, uh, it goes back to, to to what I said earlier. Is uh, people can tell when you're when you're genuine, when you're being malicious, and uh, I, I really don't care about other people's <laughs> opinions about me. Like I said, I, I'm never gonna have everybody happy, and uh, I always keep myself happy. And 
I, I learned that uh, if I make myself happy, I'll make others around me happy. Mm. And and I'm a I'm a joke. I'm a prankster. I'm a joker. And people can go through my Facebook and they'll find some old shit. You know, I really I'm sorry about you know shit I said in the past because I I have changed and that's the thing. A lot of a lot of people you know. There's this whole cancel culture going on right now. Right, you don't. Especially, people can't believe that something someone did 20 years ago was wrong. Yeah, and, and that and, maybe they've changed. Yeah, and, and, and we all we all change. Like, I'm not the same person I was in high school for sure. Like, no, no way. And and, and I'll say uh, I said some fucked up shit. Like, I'm not, I'm not gonna hide that I said some fucked up shit, and you know, uh, that was my mindset at the time. I was a stupid mindset, and I apologize for. If I offended anyone at that time, but I can say now that you know I'm not that person where, where that I was. I'm a great, a better person. Um, I think that's uh, what matters, man. Yeah, that's that's what that's what matters. If uh, you're not growing, you're dying. You no. Know, yeah, because bef- bef- I'll tell you, uh, like in 09, 2010, I I I was against like gay marriage, man, because mm-hmm. I, I was really I, <laughs> I don't know. I guess it's called church and everything. Religious. Yeah, religious. And uh, and now, you know, I'm, I'm a changed man. Especially working in West Hollywood, you know, like, that's the thing. You you don't, you really don't know until you're exposed to, to certain, you know, lifestyles or people. And working in West Hollywood, you know, there's a large uh, gay community there. And I, I think it, it had to do with that as well, like, that I just wasn't around it. So I didn't really understand. Mm-hmm. And, uh... Everybody, everybody's just people, man. Everybody wants to be happy, and you just gotta accept them for who they are. Yeah, I, I, yeah, of course. And you know, this idea of like caring so much what people think. Mm-hmm. We spend like eighty-five percent, ninety percent of our waking lives trying to manage people's perception of us, mm-hmm. trying to present ourselves a certain way, trying to make sure that we are accepted favorably, received favorably, perceived um, favorably. And what I always say is that confidence is not knowing that at all times everybody approves of you and everyone's happy with you and everybody thinks the world of you. Confidence is knowing that if they don't approve of you, if they don't think the world of you, you're okay anyway. Yeah. You know, so so we all want to be received well and perceived well. We all want to be in other people's good graces. And that makes sense. We want to have a good reputation. Everybody wants to be liked. Everybody wants to be recognized. There's nothing wrong with that. Mm-hmm. But where it becomes the danger zone is how much do you let that control your life, what you say, what you think, how you act? You know, confidence is knowing that I'm going to put my best foot forward. And if somebody likes me, that's great. I really hope they do. But if they don't, I'm okay anyway. And you don't allow someone's perception of you to change the way you see yourself. That's the most important thing. Everybody's allowed to have whatever perception of you that they want, right? Yeah. But do you allow the way they perceive you and what they think of you to influence and alter the way you see yourself. That's where it becomes really tricky. Yeah. Uh. And look, man, as you get older, a sign of, of growth and a sign of maturity is that the older you get, the smaller your social circle gets. Yeah. Because as you become older and more wise and more mature, presumably, hopefully, you become uh, more set in your values, more set in, the, in your lifestyle, more set in what you believe is right and wrong and important. And the people in your life are either a reflection of that or they're not. Yeah. So naturally, your social circle is going to shrink. And if your social circle is not shrinking, then it means that you're still holding, you haven't shed the layers of people who don't belong in your life anymore. You just remind me of something. Uh, in, in middle school, well, like Jordan has always been great, big, right? Who? Jordan's. The, oh the, shoes! The shoes, yeah. So in middle school, um, my parents, you know, they, they're not wealthy. Um, they ever them buying me uh, some shack, some shoes from, mm-hmm. from Shaquille O'Neal, mm-hmm. and I and I got I got picked on for that. It's like they made me feel like you know weird. I was like, man, I was getting bullied. I was like, oh, you're wearing shacks. Those 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 are fake fake Jordans. And I was like, 
And like you said, now that I'm older, I was like, fuck, I wish I kept those those shacks, man. Yeah, they're going to be worth a lot of money one day. <laughs> I don't even know if they're worth a lot of money, but I was like, I, I really enjoyed those shoes, man. And and, and um, Shaq's such a great person, too, because, you know, Jordan's the... People get shot for Jordans, man. That's the crazy part of it. People don't understand that. People be getting shot for Jordans, and, and Shaq came out with those shoes. Uh, I think they were available at Payless. I think that's where I got them. That's so funny. And then, yeah, people would make. make yeah, so you got these middle people. schoolers making fun of you, and all of a sudden you go home thinking you're a loser. Yeah, but it, but luckily I had you know my parents. I had such a great great parents, and uh, they, they they always fill me with confidence, especially my dad. My mm. dad, like, man, that guy, he can talk to anybody. That. It's cool because I have both sides. My mom, as you met, she's really shy. She's quiet, super quiet. And she's very direct. <laughs> and then my dad, man, he can talk up a storm. Mm. So it's cool getting out that, that balance from sure. both of them. Sure. And, uh, yeah, like, I, I always wonder, like, how people get insecure. Because, like, my, my dad, he never he never made me feel insecure. He, mm. I, I picked up a lot from him. He, uh, he he's also I would say similar to me. He has a, a positive mindset. He's never upset. And uh, I just took what he has, and now I'm trying to apply it to the financial life. Sure. Because <laughs> I, I feel I feel and my you dad will. has so much potential. I, I I wish my dad, you know, he's watching this. I, I really hope that uh, he can grow his business because he has so much potential and he has this gift of talking to people that. Uh, that I only have a, a small fraction of it. And uh, I wish I could be more like him. Yeah, but you have the brains, man. Yeah, I got the brains, exactly. It's amazing. <laughs> so it's just a, uh, working on it. But yeah. You know. Dude. Well, thank you for sharing this with me. Thank you for having me well, on thank today, you for man. Coming. I really appreciate it. And, uh, I know it's uh, been really tough because of the heat and all. No, it's been my pleasure, man. No, no. Thank it, you, brother. It was really great. And uh, thank you so much. I appreciate thank you, bro. It. Let's do it again yeah, soon. Definitely, definitely. And uh, we're going to be. Hopefully in a better place next time we do this. And, uh, hey, hell yeah, every day. Making that paper, <laughs> baby. <laughs> All right, guys, well, oh, um, you want to promote any stuff you have, your channel, or, or how people can reach out to you? For yeah, it? I would love to, yeah. Um, as, I, as I said, if anybody listening to this has any questions, they want to talk to me about a situation, they need advice, they need guidance, they just need someone to listen to, please, please, please reach out to me. Um, my Instagram is Kevin Nahai, K-E-V-I-N. N A H A I. Hopefully, you can write it somewhere. Yeah, uh, okay. I respond to every comment. I respond to every DM. Um, I'm always here to listen and you chat over the phone and whatever. So, please uh, give me a follow and please reach out. Yeah, and uh, it's really great because, as as you heard Kevin's story, you know he had issues, and the best way to get advice is for someone who's gone through it. So, you know, if, if you had any issues suffering depression, anxiety, or eating disorder. Kevin's your go-to, man. Thank you so, so much, bro. Thank you for, for being here and uh, for sharing with us. And, uh, you know, I really wish you well. And, and I know you're going you know, to do even more great stuff. So. so, all right, guys. Thank you for being with us. And see you next time. Bye.